getting into Acts chapter 2, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Um, gonna, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive on some stuff this morning. Uh, and then also we have, uh, Maylee is still hiking <laughs> the deserts of Arizona. We were praying for her this morning. She'll be back with us next week. And uh, we have a brother, Mark Seymour, that's going to be leading us in worship this morning. So excited about that. So a few announcements before we get rolling here. Uh, last Sunday after service, Chuck Porter and I uh, had uh, received a call back. I had reached out to some care homes in town. This has been our heart to sort of increase our footprint in the community here with outreach and an area that we have noted uh, that is often neglected is for people that are in convalescent homes. If they're convalescing from surgery or they're uh, simply getting older or they're nearing the end of life, there's a whole variety of reasons people end up in those facilities and they're often forgotten. So it's been on our hearts to reach out. And we got a phone call back from Marquis, post-acute care home here in Newburgh. And the gal was just excited. So Chuck and I went down there and we talked to her and she just threw the door open. I mean, they're open to us doing everything from a Sunday service there uh, with their residents to us coming in on a Saturday night or coming in during the week and doing a variety of things. So we're excited. I, I told Chuck we were sitting in the car on the way back and I said, you know, I just think about when the Lord says, I set before you an open door and we have an open door. <laughs> and this, this woman, at least as much as I can discern, doesn't know the Lord, but that's all right. She doesn't know the Lord for now, um, <laughs> but we're excited. So next Sunday, all of that is to say that next Sunday after the service, uh, yeah, we're going <laughs> to, I spent a lot of years in the advertising business. We're, so the hook is we're going to serve pizza for anybody that wants to come. <laughs> but anyway, no, we're going to do a lunch meeting after service next Sunday. If you're interested, you don't, I'm going to, I'll pass around the sign up during the, the service today. And, and it's not like if you sign up that you're like obligated and we're going to rope you in and, and make you do stuff. No, it's just if you're interested in being used in our community in this way, uh, with this particular ministry, we're excited. And, and so sign up, mainly so that I don't have much pizza to buy. So um, we want to be sure that uh, we can get together and we'll either do that here in the sanctuary or we'll go across the driveway into the classroom and, uh, and, and just talk about, toss ideas around about how we want to structure this. We are totally open to the Holy Spirit's leading, which we'll be talking about this morning. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you're interested, sign up. And, uh, and we'll get together after service next week. Okay, so this week, Tuesday, women's study is on. Is that correct, Terry? Yes. All right, good. I am forever mixed up on that. Uh, so 11 o'clock here, ladies. Uh, please park off-site because the fish store uses the parking lot during the week. I'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Tuesday night, the men's study will be here. We're wrapping up a series by Francis Schaefer, uh, and then we're going to be getting and doing some other things that I've got some ideas on. I'll be talking to Rick about and um, all that. So Tuesday night, 6.30 here uh, for the men's study and also the men's study online Thursday morning at 7.30. Uh, again, if you're interested in that, we use a ble uh, an app called Blue Jeans and it's easy to set up. We'll get you hooked up if you'd like to be a part of that. So with that, uh, oh, one last thing. Ethan... Um, Swihart, you guys don't see a lot of him because he's up in the booth. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was going to sell his truck and he had to get the title replaced and he found out that it's going to take the state uh, a number of weeks to, to do that. So he has to find a place to park his truck while he's waiting for it because they have an apartment. <laughs> and so if you have a parking spot that you would uh, <laughs> want to share... Uh, please see Ethan after the service. Uh, we'll, uh, if, if nobody comes forward now, we'll probably put out a text blast too with our Remind app. So uh, with that, let's pray and worship the Lord. Father, uh, as we come in here this morning, we, we do settle our hearts, Lord, just casting off the things of this world, the concerns and the cares of this life. And for a little while, Lord, we want to 
fully focus on you and what you want to accomplish here this morning. We pray, Father, for the worship. Lord, that as we, as we sing, that it would be a sacrifice of praise and that you would receive our worship. Lord, that you would, as your word declares, that you would dwell within the praises of your people. Uh, we pray also, Father, for your word as it goes out. Uh, Jesus, you told us that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And that's our desire. That's my desire, Lord, that as your word goes out, that people would hear your voice, follow you. So we commit ourselves toward that end. We pray that you would loose your spirit upon each heart, that you would accomplish that which you desire to accomplish in us because we're, we're yielded to that work. We give it to you and it's for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And then just hold your finger there, because we'll get to it eventually. <laughs> By the way, Ethan, you have at least two places to park your truck. <laughs> I love it. In the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, the disciples had spent a great deal of time with Jesus. He'd opened their hearts, their minds, to the scriptures, to the kingdom of God. Afterwards, remember in chapter 1, we saw that they'd gone out to Bethany, um, just on the backside of the Mount of Olives, uh, and there Jesus had been lifted up. Uh, being received up into the cloud, it says, uh, into heaven, not just into the sky. So now, as he had instructed, they had gathered to wait for what he said would be the promise of the Father, the coming Holy Spirit. He said, you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit there. So last week, we looked at the upper room in Jerusalem, uh, probably the same upper room where they had celebrated the Last Supper, the Passover with Jesus when he'd been crucified. Might have not been. We don't know exactly, but uh, it's likely. Uh, and that's where Jesus and his disciples, or his disciples had been staying, and they had gathered with a, a bunch of other people. Remember, we looked at that with men and women, the mother of Jesus and all, about 120 people. So while they were there in the upper room, Peter, quoting the Psalms, had said that they needed to appoint a replacement for Judas. Now, last week we looked at that, at the thought, and, and into interpretation here. So take your pick. Maybe it was something that got ordained. Perhaps it wasn't. I tend to believe that because they had not yet received the Holy Spirit, that this was sort of Peter's last attempt at trying to work things out in his own strength. But <laughs> his motives were good. Uh, his intentions were good. He was a godly man. He loved the Lord. However, the method that he used in this endeavor was, in my opinion, lacking. Uh, it's here that Matthias was chosen through casting lots, uh, named among the 12 apostles. The interesting thing there is that he's not named or heard from again in all the pages of Scripture. So, uh, again, take your pick. So now as we begin chapter 2, we'll see that it is the Feast of Pentecost, and that's important. It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. It's one of the seven annual feasts uh, or festivals that the Jews had. They were observed every year. And I want to spend some time, I made a chart. This is, I, I've used this chart before, and I, I keep modifying it and changing it just to add things. Uh, and I want to use this chart, and we're going to go through this might look a little complicated on the front end, but I want to go through this together because I want you to understand some things about this feast. Because my reasoning for this is it's not, it's, well, for us, it's critically important we understand the significance of what's going on here in Acts chapter 2, uh, because this is more than a random day or a random holiday in Judaism. It's a day that was foreseen in the plan of God all the way back to eternity past. As you'll see, there's an unmistakable prophetic linkage to a greater reality in these feasts. Uh, these feasts were shadows. They foreshadowed some very critically important things, part of which was what we look at in Acts chapter 2 with the Feast of Pentecost 
and, and the advent or the giving of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at this chart, you'll see there on the left, it says spring feasts. On the right, it says fall feasts. Uh, of these seven, four were the spring feasts. Uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and weeks, or Pentecost. The three were fall feasts. There was a, a, a gap, a period of time in between the spring feasts and the fall feasts, and those were the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So three of these, as you see, the three of them are in blue, Passover, Weeks, and Tabernacles. Those were called solemn feasts. Uh, and, and those were feasts that were required. If you were a male uh, Jew over the age of 20, you were required to travel to Jerusalem and to observe this feast. It was not optional. It was mandatory in Judaism. And you'll see that the, the, the months that separate them, if you see that in small type above the name of each feast, I have 114, 115 through 22, and 116 for the first three. They're all back to back. Uh, they're one day apart. And then we go out 50 days to the Feast of Weeks, and that's in the third month. This is on the Hebrew calendar. The first month was Nisan. Uh, the third month was Sivan. And then going out to the Fall Feast, all of those occurred in the seventh month, which was uh, Tishri. So all of, all of that is to say that these things were grouped on purpose by God when he ordained them. And if we look at, in, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 23, God gives detailed instructions on all seven of these feasts there. We're not going to go back and, and look at it. You're welcome to go and check it out yourself. So uh, we, as we look at these, the, the, the solemn feasts in blue were the ones that the guys had to go to, but the others were optional. But they were already there in the city, for Passover, so chances are they stayed for the other two. I want to go and look at each one of these feasts because each one points, as I said, to a greater reality, a greater fulfillment that we see uh, in the New Testament. So we're going to start with Passover. We'll work our way through uh, primarily the first four because that's what Pentecost is, the fourth of these three or of these four spring feasts. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the fall feast just because there's, again, prophetic significance uh, in those. If you see at the bottom, these first four were historically, they were fulfilled during Jesus's first coming. All right? And then I've got a, a, that red circle around. It says the church age. That's the, the, the time gap between Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets. You'll understand more about that as we go. And then these last three, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles, are yet to be fulfilled. So those are fulfill, fulfilled in the second advent or the second coming of Christ. Uh, but let's dive into Passover here, and, and then we'll work our way through this. I, I really, it's just important to me that you understand that there is a design here. I mean, and there is a divine design to these feasts from the time that they were ordained in the heart of God to their fulfillment in the early church and in Judaism up until then and their ultimate fulfillment in the timeline and the plan of God. Uh, really important we understand that Pentecost is more than just a day on the Hebrew calendar. So the, the Feast of Passover... Uh, it looks back to Exodus chapter 12, if you remember, if you know the, the story of Moses and, and God using him to set the people uh, go, the, the Israelites who were held in bondage in Egypt and all of that, goes through 10 plagues. And the 10th one uh, was where the blood of a lamb was sprinkled on the doorposts of the Jewish homes there in Egypt. And, and uh, it caused the spirit of the Lord to pass over them uh, during the last plague when death visited the firstborn of everyone who did not have the blood over their home, over their house. Now, John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, verse 29, he says this. He says that John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John immediately saw, and 
again, uh, was given utterance by the Spirit of God himself that this is the fulfillment of what God had set out in the Passover. Uh, he's the final Old Testament prophet, recognized that the Christ, the Lamb of God, had come. So Passover is fulfilled in Jesus as those covered by the blood of the Lamb of God, uh, and they will, as a result, escape the spiritual death and eternal judgment, which God will bring upon all who reject him. Serious stuff. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the Apostle Paul, uh, he's issuing, a, <laughs> which is kind of typical with 1 Corinthians, it's a, it's a letter of re rebuke, and he's issuing a rebuke about them allowing sexual immorality in the church. Uh, but he says, uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, clean out the old leaven. Now, leaven in the Bible is always symbolic of sin. That's right. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. He's saying you already are, but clean out the old leaven. He says, for Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed. So again, Paul, recognizing that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Passover, of that feast, going all the way back to early Judaism. So he says that we've already been unleavened, yet he exhorts the Corinthians to clean out uh, the old leaven. Again, this speaks of our sanctification. When we were in the book of Romans, we talked about sanctification, what that means. It, it, and it has to do with holiness. We have been cleansed. We've been declared holy through simply putting our faith in the finished work of Christ. And we are being cleansed. We are being made more into the likeness of his son every day as we yield ourselves to him. That takes us to the second feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this followed one day after the Passover, uh, and it lasted for about a week. Uh, during that time, the Jews didn't eat any bread with yeast in it, with leaven. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And they did this in remembrance of their haste in preparing to depart from Egypt. Remember, the Pharaoh was after them, and they said, we got to go now. And so they, they took their bread that had not yet risen and all of that. And so it, they did this to commemorate their needing to leave in a hurry. They're needing to leave hastily from the land of Egypt. So continuing in 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 8, uh, Paul continues. He says, therefore, let's celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Again, uh, after Jesus, our Passover, died on the cross, we're told that his body had to be hastily prepared to be put into the tomb. This is totally a fulfillment of what we're seeing in this feast. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, remember, he went to Pilate. He said, give me the body, and you know, sunset is coming, all of that. Uh, and, and he needed to get that done to get his body down from the cross and get him into the tomb in a hurry because they couldn't work once the sun had set because Sabbath would be upon them and guess what feast would begin? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Unleavened Bread also speaks of Jesus's sinless humanity. We're told in the Bible that he was tempted in all ways even as we are and yet without sin. Second Corinthians tells us that he became sin that we could become the righteousness of God in him. In John chapter 12, there's an interesting passage there. Uh, a, a group of Greeks had come to see Jesus, and they went to his disciples, and uh, one disciple went to another disciple who went to Jesus, and they kind of worked their way up the line, I guess. And, and Jesus, perceiving why they had come and why they wanted to talk with him, uh, it says in, in John 12, 23, that Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So Jesus' body now would be in the grave during the first days of this feast like a kernel of wheat planted, waiting to burst forth 
as the bread of life. Fascinating. The third feast we see here, first fruits. Now, this occurred two days after Passover and was a celebration uh, of the first harvest of the season. A lot of these feasts had ties. Yeah, they had significant ties back to Israel's history, but they also had ties to the agricultural uh, aspect of what was going on in their day. They were an agrarian society, and they had these feasts set up that they celebrated different aspects of the harvest. So uh, it was a day of thanksgiving. First fruits was a day of thanksgiving to God because of his provision, his abundant provision. But it was also a day of expectation. And I think that that's, that's worth looking at, of looking forward to the harvest to come. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So, quick recap, Passover looked forward to Christ's death. Jesus was crucified at Passover. Unleavened bread looked forward to the removal of sin that's symbolized in our burial with him. Jesus was in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now first fruits look forward to Christ's resurrection and our new life in him. Jesus' resurrection occurred on the same day as the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of those who are asleep. Asleep being a euphemism for physical death. So I know I'm moving rapidly through this, but I want you to catch the significance. It will get more significant as we go uh, because the resurrection marks the certainty that we who believe will rise from the dead on the last day. I mean, that's why as we're looking at celebrating the resurrection next month, why it's so important. The Feast of Fru First Fruits also points to a new quality of life that we as believers would have in Christ. We'll get to that as we look at the text this morning. But because he rose from the dead, understand that the power of sin in our lives is broken. Yes, through the work he did on the cross, the penalty for sin was paid. When he rose from the dead, now signifying that his sacrifice had been acceptable to the Father, death couldn't hold him, now the power of sin is broken. So the penalty for sin has been paid. The power of sin can now be broken in our lives. We look forward to the day when we're with him where the presence of sin is no longer. In this life, we still deal with that. The point is, is that in Romans 6.11, Paul says that we can now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reckon ourselves dead to sin, uh, alive to Christ, so the, first, the fourth of these feasts that I want to look at as we work our way through the chart and the day that we're looking at in Acts chapter 2 is the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Now, this feast, it, it didn't have a set day. The other three did, a set calendar day. This feast, it, it had a set day, but that day was established by the last feast. Uh, it occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of First Fruits. Now, uh, the Feast of Weeks, it's called Shavuot. Uh, it's hard for me to pronounce Hebrew. But it occurred the first day after the seventh Sabbath, after the Feast of First Fruits. That was the, the prescription that God gave there in Leviticus 23. Uh, that's why it's called Pentecost. It's 50 days. It's a, seven, it's a week of Sabbath, seven Sabbaths, seven weeks, and one day, 50 days. Uh, in Luke, er, Leviticus 23, he says, you'll count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So this feast in itself was significant in two ways. First, it had an historical significance. It commemorated the giving of the law to Moses there on Mount Sinai. But it also had an agricultural significance because the agricultural focus of this festival was gratitude to God for the harvest. Interesting. 
Now, it's fulfilled here in Acts chapter 2 in the great harvest of souls that we'll see as we go through this chapter uh, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was what it pointed to. That's the greater reality. So the church would be established on this day as God poured out the Spirit. Now, both Jew and Gentile from this point forward would be brought into the kingdom beginning at Pentecost and then throughout the church age, as we see the church age illustrated there between weeks and trumpets on the chart. So I want to look at this from a little bit different point of view. Let's look at it from a covenant point of view. You know what a covenant is? It's a contract. Uh, the, the Old Testament is the Old Covenant. It's Testament, contract, covenant. That's essentially the same word. They're synonymous terms. The New Testament is the new contract, the new covenant, the New Testament. So the Old Covenant law uh, was inaugurated through the blood of a lamb on a doorpost in Egypt. The New Covenant, grace, was inaugurated through the blood of the lamb on a cross at Calvary. Passing through the Red Sea, the Jews would be baptized into Moses as they left Egypt behind. This pointed to the greater reality which would be fulfilled through the resurrection of Christ. Baptism is now a symbol of being baptized into his death. That's why we immerse and then raise to newness of life. Fifty days out from their deliverance from Egypt, the old covenant would be ratified through Moses bringing the tablets of the law down Mount Sinai. When Moses came down with the tablets... He found the people worshiping a golden cow. Didn't work out well for them. The golden calf. They'd torn their rings off and, and thrown them all. Aaron, I love Aaron's response. Oh, we just threw the golden and this calf popped out. <laughs> totally passed the buck. Anyway, as a result, Moses instructed the Levites to take their swords and go throughout the camp and dispatch the ones who were responsible not a good day. In Exodus 32, 28, we read, so the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. 3,000 died. 50 days out from man's deliverance from the world, 50 days out from the sacrifice of Christ, the new covenant would be ratified through the Holy Spirit coming down on Mount Zion. The old covenant, God comes down on Mount Sinai. and the new covenant, he comes down on Mount Zion. Whole different approach. As we'll see later in this chapter, the church will be birthed as Peter, now filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel to the people. In, in Acts 2.42, which we will not get anywhere near today, but we'll cover it, it says, those who, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about... 3,000 souls were added to them. Old covenant, 3,000 die. New covenant, 3,000 gain life. Finally, I want you to notice where the church age stands prophetically as it relates to these seven feasts. The spring feasts were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, as I mentioned, culminating at Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Question. What is the very next event that we, the church, wait for? The rapture of the church. Amen. Look at the first of the fall feasts. The Feast of Trumpets. Its origin. In Exodus 19, we read in verse 18 and 19, now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the entire mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. This was a violent scene. We're told that even if a beast should touch the mountain, it would die. The people were so freaked out. Yeah, that's a Bible word. No, it's not. 
But they were so freaked out by it that they, they begged Moses. They said, you talk to God and we'll talk to you. Then you talk, and you talk to us. We don't want to have any direct contact with this being. Folks, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It's here in the pages of Scripture. And the parallels and exact dates used through all of this are both striking and intentional. You've got to understand this is the, the divine linkage between that covenant, those feasts, and what is fulfilled in Christ and what is yet to be fulfilled. And we stand in the midst of it all. If you don't see your life hidden in the pages of Scripture, you have a wrong idea of Scripture. It's not a book that's out here. It's something that we're living. It's something that's unfolding even as we breathe. And, and if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. The prophetic significance is amazing here. Now, moving from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, we're told in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And I don't know where that'll be, but we do know that the Spirit is given there at Zion. We'll get to that in a minute. It says that he'll descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, the shofar. I mean, they didn't have trumpets like you see, you know, Dixieland thing. It was a ram's horn that they blew, and it was, it was to announce the significance of the event. In Moses' day, it was to announce the giving of the law, to announce the covenant that God was making with his people, that he was ratifying. In that day, the shofar will blow at the Feast of Trumpets and the church will be taken up. Notice on Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, that the Spirit comes down and trumpets. We're told in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the restrainer will be taken out of the way. Who's the restrainer? The Holy Spirit. What is God's representation on this earth this day? The church, which was established, which was, which was brought into being there at Pentecost 2,000 years ago and continues till now and with the rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way and then we're told that the man of lawlessness would be revealed, the Antichrist. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Harpazo. I mean, snatched away together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Remember in Acts chapter 1, the angel said he'll return the same way as he left. This is it. As we see in the book of Revelation, the trumpets symbolize judgment. The two remaining feasts to follow shortly are the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. With the rapture of the church, the restrainer of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world. And at that time, a seven-year period of great trouble, we call it the Great Tribulation, begins as the wrath of God is poured out through seven seals seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Following the great tribulation will be the millennial reign of Christ. That's where Jesus reigns personally from Jerusalem for a thousand years, a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, everything I just covered, I want you to forget. <laughs> you don't have to forget. But I do want to make a point. I mean, it's important that our understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit have a biblical framework. Amen? <laughs> it has to. And I think it's awesome how God ordained these events so long ago, which as mentioned, point to a greater reality, a reality that's realized in the days that we live in. However, 
I want our study of the Holy Spirit to reach beyond having an academic understanding. We can't afford to stop at being book smart about this. Because if we stopped here, it would benefit us nothing. On the other hand, we need to, to have balance because if we're not grounded biblically when it comes to the person and the work and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we're wide open to the blatant heresies which surround and dishonor this third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. Gotta be careful. We also run the risk of shortchanging ourselves and not walking in the fullness of the Spirit and the power He brings to our lives every single day. So important. He's the lifeblood of the body of Christ, the church. Now, A.W. Tozer, I came across a quote here. He had this to say regarding the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. He says, if the church today, I'm not talking about our church, he's talking about the larger church today. If the church today were in a situation where the Spirit had left the church, 95% of what is done would keep on going, and nobody would know the difference. In the book of Acts, if the Holy Spirit had left the church, 95% of what they were doing would have come to a screeching halt, and everybody would have known the difference. My point is, let's approach this with a fresh understanding and a real desire, personally, as to how each of us may walk in a greater fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now we get to verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So according to Leviticus, as we saw, the day of Pentecost would have fallen on the first day of the week. A Sunday. Now, the early church adopted this day as a day of worship, and that's why the church traditionally worships on Sunday to this day. This is where it comes from. We don't know exactly where the followers of Christ were gathered at this time, but we can assume they're still in the upper room. They, we haven't told that there's a change of address here. We know that further, there had to be because uh, 3,000 people come to the Lord that day. Uh, but here... I believe they're still in the upper room. And it fits with chapter 1. There's 120 people waiting, praying in one accord for the promise of the Father and all that. So the Passover had been celebrated in the middle of April, if you look at the Jewish calendar. Therefore, Pentecost fell at the beginning of June. By the way, this year it's on June 5th. I don't think that there's prophetic significance to that. Other than it's a few months or a couple of months after the Passover. So my point is, at this time, the traveling conditions in, in the empire for people that were traveling from different parts of the empire would be really good. This is getting into the dry season. It's not balmy hot like it is in July and August. Uh, and I, I believe that at least as many would come to this feast, to Pentecost, uh, one of the required feasts, by the way, so that all the young guys, all the men would be there, as would be at the Passover feast. It, Passover was, yeah, by far the most important of these feasts, but Pentecost would have been a, a time where people would find ease in travel. Remember, the first century, the Romans built roads, and so there were roads from all over the empire that came to Jerusalem. So the point in that is there would have been a large international crowd in Jerusalem at this feast. Verse 2, and suddenly, I like that word, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So Jesus had told these guys, he, he told them to expect the Holy Spirit, but he never told them the manner in which he would come. So they're just there being faithful. They're just there doing what God had told them, Jesus had told them to do. And all of a sudden, there's a sound. Think about it. It's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Everyone is in one accord. Now, there's a little bit of significance there because 9 a.m. was the time, time of the morning sacrifice and the morning service down the hill at the temple. All right? So it's quite possible that one of the apostles was leading a prayer and praise service there in the upper room. We don't know. We don't know exactly what they were doing, but we do know that they were shocked. 
when this happened, when this, this came about. And I want you to notice, too, that Luke chooses his words very, very carefully here. He's trying to describe for us an exceptionally remarkable supernatural event. And, and, and he's, an, he's an educated guy. He is picking his words very, very carefully. He says the coming of the Spirit, uh, that it was as like... Uh, as of a rushing mighty wind. He doesn't say it was a mighty wind. It says it was like that. And we don't know exactly what that meant, but we know that it was significant. The coming of the Spirit involved uh, here, as we look in Acts, in these first four verses, it involved a sound to hear, a sight to see, and a miracle to experience. So they're just being bathed in this whole scene here. Uh, and taking his words literally, here's what might have been taking place. As they're sitting in the upper room, suddenly everyone heard a sound that seemed to be coming from heaven. I mean, I picture this, and, and, and I think, have you ever heard somebody describe a tornado? That's a violent rushing wind. I mean, they say it sounds like a freight train. I mean, there's this, this, just this intense, like a palpable noise uh, anyway, they hear this sound. It grew louder and louder until it reached them. And when it did, they felt as if they'd been struck by a strong gust of wind. Then this heavenly sound surrounded them and it filled the whole room. Again, remarkable. They have no way of knowing what they heard. I, we don't know if it was music or singing or angelic praise or the voice of God himself. We have no idea. But they physically felt it come over them as of a strong wind. And they were enveloped by it, permeated by it. Verse 3. And then appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. Now again, he uses the term as of. He's saying, like fire. So the idea behind the picture of fire here is purification. That's what fire symbolizes when you look in God's word. It has to do with purification. Like a refiner's fire is used to purify metal, to purify gold. The divided tongues mentioned here uh, is probably a reference to the miraculous manifestation of various languages, as we'll see in the following verses. Now, I believe God is using this to show the coming upon of the Holy Spirit is not just for power. It's also for purity. There's that aspect. When we consider the holiness of God, and I'll tell you what, folks, Western culture doesn't pay a lot of attention to the holiness of God, and we should. We should have a good working understanding of the holiness of God. It is moral purity as relates to infinity, as relates to perfection. And that's when I look at God and I say, you are, I'm not. And yet we're all in process. This is why for believers, once we come to Christ, the old life just doesn't seem to fit. That's why it feels like square pegs into round holes. The old ways are no longer, they just, I'm not comfortable. I've mentioned before, uh, sometimes with some people, when they come to Christ, their vocabulary shrinks a bunch. <laughs> but it's because this purity, the holy, he's called the Holy Spirit for a reason. God works in us through the Holy Spirit, a personal desire, and, and, I, and, and I invite you, check your heart, for personal, practical holiness. To live well. To live, to, as John says in 1 John, to walk in the light as he is in the light. If that's not the case in your life, repent. Change your mind. If you're living carnally, if you're seeing how close to the edge you can live without slipping over, you're not living the way that's talked about here. Now, when he uses the term that this divided tongue of fire, 
and, and one sat upon each of them. The, the term sat here in verse 3, it's a forceful word in the original. It seems as insignificant, but it really is very significant to understanding this verse because it denotes permanence or completeness. In other words, it permanently sat, it fixed upon each one of them. In other words, the Holy Spirit coming upon someone brings a very real, permanent, complete change from within. It's also interesting to note that in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit rested upon the nation of Israel. In the New Covenant, the relationship has changed. It's from a group to a group of individuals. The Holy Spirit rests upon each one of these people individually. The tongues of fire sat upon each of them. And that's significant. What that tells me is this is personal. Very personal. The Spirit manifesting as he did in the upper room with the wind and the fire, had, that had never happened before and has never happened since. There are lots of different manifestations of the Spirit, but it, this, this took place once. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in verse 2, they hear the Spirit coming upon them. In verse 3, they see the Spirit coming upon them. In verse 4, they experience the Spirit coming upon them as they're now filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now comes the equipping. Now comes the power. Now come the gifts. Now comes the boldness to be witnesses, the ones whom Jesus had called them to be. Remember, this is an equipping. This isn't just so that we can get up and have the Holy Ghost talent show, guys. I see lots of that out there in the media and in like junk, spiritual junk food. But this is for power and this is for a purpose. It's for God's purposes to be worked out in our lives so that we can effectively serve him. In a moment in time, this is the birth of the church. In a moment of time, the ecclesia, that's the Greek word for the called out ones, the set apart ones, the church of Jesus Christ is born. So imagine with me being there in the room with these men and women as they begin to speak with other languages and they have perfect understanding of one another. Another thing, just a side note. Remember the Tower of Babel? Men said, let's build a tower and reach up to God. And God essentially said, oh, no, you don't. And he foiled their attempts by confounding their languages, confusing. They could not understand one another, so they quit. Look at what's happening here. Instead of reaching up to God, God is reaching down to man and he's unifying their languages so that they now in one accord can move forward. Powerful, powerful stuff. Now remember too, we're told in chapter one that Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. I mean, she's there at Pentecost for this. What do you think was going on in her mom's heart? Ladies? I mean... I, I just think about this and I think, you know, she treasured all those things up in her heart when the angel first visited her and then she knew as she saw her son grow, she knew that she had been blessed with the Messiah as a son. She had seen him go off to the tomb and, and, and hang on the cross, the whole deal. And now, and now she witnesses this miraculous event. And I think in her heart of hearts, she knows what's going on. There's something that, that is so strikingly beautiful in this. Now, as everyday men and women, just like you and I, are filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, also, I, I want to be careful with terminologies here and spend a minute talking about that. I've spoken about the Holy Spirit's ministry being that of being with and then in and then upon, and that's true. Uh, the, I, we spent some time in the scripture searching those out. 
Now, the main reason for that is to give biblical clarity to different aspects of the Spirit's work in a person's life. And that's good. There's a danger, though. If we don't do that, we leave the door open for all manner of nonsense in the name of God and in the name of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned, tons of that out there. On the other hand, the danger in doing that comes when a person drifts into dogma, if we start getting hung up on the terminologies that we're talking about here. One can become dogmatic in trying to make every event or manifestation of the Spirit fit into a tidy little box. In the nearly 40 years I've been walking with the Lord, there have been times where I've been either baffled or stood in absolute awe with regard to the Spirit's work. Powerful, powerful manifestations. Now, these are things that did not contradict God's word. I I want to be clear on that because if there is a manifestation of the Spirit that contradicts God's word, guess what? It's very likely, probably, is the work of the great imitator. Satan can duplicate anything except he can't impart life, which is a chief purpose of the Holy Spirit being given, being born again of the Spirit. So these things that I've, I've witnessed, they did, were things that contradicted God's Word, but I couldn't easily support them from God's Word. Something was coming about in my life or in the life of another. Understand I am not advocating unscriptural practices of the Spirit's work here. God forbid. God forbid. The Lord knows there's plenty of that going around. I'm simply saying, let God be God when it comes to the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Enough said. So it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit reveals himself to sinful men. He does that but he does not indwell sinful man. That's not possible. You need to be a cleansed vessel for the Spirit to come in. That's why one must be born again. Specifically, as I mentioned, born again of the Spirit. It's essential that the Spirit... If you're not born again, the Spirit of God cannot indwell you. He he cannot come. He will be with. He will reveal himself. But you have to belong to Christ. We see here that these men and women had received, they were indwelled by, they were baptized in, they experienced the coming upon of the Holy Spirit. He says here that they were filled. And that's good enough for me. Again, we can can try to get... I look at the way that these things are put forth in God's Word... And and they're not contradictions. They're just different ways to describe similar events. That's why I caution, don't get hung up on terminology. From here forward, they, as well as the church in general, would be utterly reliant upon the Spirit's work. That's the point. What about you? There have been many times in my life where I have prayed specifically for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you're feeling powerless this morning. Perhaps you're not sensing the Lord's presence as you once did. Perhaps you have a great need to see God move in some specific way. Perhaps you've never received the Holy Spirit because you've never given your life to Christ. I want to close with a passage from Luke chapter 11. And Jesus is speaking with his disciples. In Luke 11, verses 9 through 13, we read this. He says, so I say to you, ask, and it'll be given. To you. Seek, you'll find. Knock, 
will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened. Folks, this is not a maybe. This is a promise. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And this is Jesus' point. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Folks, if you are sensing a lack of the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, what Jesus says here is there's an easy remedy for that. Ask. Ask for a fresh baptism, a fresh filling. Again, I don't want to get hung up on the terminologies here. But ask the Lord to fill you afresh. And I guarantee you, based on the word of God, he will do it. I love the fact that he knows who we are. He says, it's not based on you. You're evil. (laughs) It's based on my father in heaven. He's not. He's holy. And he'll give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Awesome. Wonderful blessing. Wonderful promise. You see, because there's God's part giving the Holy Spirit. There's our part, walking deliberately, willfully choosing to walk in the power of the Spirit. Again, I I caution, don't get hung up on terminologies, but I do want to stress, it's not talking about getting into goofy stuff here. There's so much that's done in the name of God that, and I don't want to spend, I don't want to give the enemy a lot of airtime on that. I give him enough as it is just because there's so much that's pervasive out there in the church in general. And yet the beauty of the Spirit's indwelling, the beauty of the Spirit's coming upon, the beauty of the Spirit's empowering a person to live is such a blessing. Don't miss it because you're fearful. Don't miss it. I, you know, I, folks, I will tell you, I remember when I was in Bible college, we had a worship service every Sunday night. We'd had our nose, noses stuck in the Word all week, every day, every night. I mean, it was a very intense time in my life as far as study and all that goes. And so Sunday night, we just set it aside. We said, you know what? We're not opening the books. We're just going to worship. And those are some of the most beautiful worship services. And I remember when I had studied through 1 Corinthians I, and we got to the part about tongues and spiritual gifts and all of that. I said, God, I don't want that. I do not want that gift. I do not. I have seen so much abuse. I've seen so much done, so much showmanship in, in the alleged name of God. I just don't want it. And I found out that one night, I, I found out what it is to tell God what to and not to do. I was at this particular worship service and I was in the spirit and I was just just pouring my heart out to the Lord in this beautiful language. Went right past my brain. Just began to come as I began to pray and to sing quietly in the spirit. And God gave me that gift. Is that the hallmark gift of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. For me, I just stood there. I I couldn't sing anymore. I began to weep. And I I was there in my 20s, you know, a big old mop of black hair and all that. But I'm there and I just just began to weep and, and, and just say, Lord, this is so beautiful. The work of the Holy Spirit is so beautiful. And, and he was, during that time, I remember, because I got to Bible college, I was like a year and a half or two years old in the Lord, and I didn't know nothing about nothing. And I remember walking through the, the campus of the Bible college one day. It was before I started. There was snow on the ground, and the campus was empty. It was before the semester started. And I was praying, Lord, what am I doing here? <laughs> I remember 
saying, I am just a dumb sign painter. I was a journeyman sign painter at the time, had my brushes and all that. And at 10 years old, I had picked up a Bible in my bedroom and I tried to read it. I still, in my mind's eye, I still see it in my 10-year-old mind going, I don't want to understand this. And I prayed right there in my bedroom that day. I said, God, I got to under, I don't know what this says. I can't understand it, but I know somehow it's important. Please help me to understand this. In that parking lot of that Bible college that day at 28 years old, whatever it was, when I said, God, what am I doing here? He brought that scene back to my mind. And the Spirit of God confirmed to my heart, I'm answering your prayer from 18 years ago. And I've got you here because I want, by my Holy Spirit, to open my word to you. Again, I look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit, gang, and it's not, it's not a show. He is to be revered, respected deeply, And his work is intensely personal. I'll bet every person that was in that room that day left changed. He's no different today. As we stand here, as we sit here this morning, and we are past the Feast of Pentecost, and we're waiting for the Feast of Trumpets, we live in a time that's so exciting. I believe that we're bumping right up against it. I personally do. The birth pangs, the signs are real, they're there, and they're multiple. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, come afterwards. Rick or Harvey or I will pray for you to receive a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Don't walk out of here without being empowered for your life. Don't be fearful. Nobody's going to do some weird thing. We pray. God moves. That's how it works. Let's pray. Father, I I pray for each one here and also each one within the sound of my voice, those that are watching online, and pray, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, come. Fall upon this place. Fall upon each heart. Issue forth with power in our lives. Lord, we don't just want you, we need you. Open your word to our hearts, to our lives. Give us the ability to understand it. Open our hearts to you. And Lord, for those that don't know you, that don't have a personal relationship, let today be the day. Let it be the day where they open themselves to Jesus dying on that cross personally for them. And as a result of now being a cleansed vessel, prepared for you to come in take up residence in their heart. So Father, we're just grateful this morning. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the book of Acts and how you're speaking to us, how you're instructing us from it. We're grateful, Lord, as we look all the way back at these seven feasts in Israel and we see the significance prophetically. We see the significance in our lives, how that applies, those truths apply to us here and now. We're grateful. Lord, for your work. We're grateful that you've given us this place to gather and to come and to see to it that Jesus, the name of Jesus, is lifted up. We pray now that you would receive our worship in Jesus' name. Amen.